to check and see. All right, we think we finally got everything started here. Let's give us a moment as we get the rest of the team in place. The team is checking right now to see if everything is broadcasting correctly. Instagram feed up to go. So good to see everybody here tonight. I know that a small group is gathered here to help us broadcast and worship and praise the Lord. Our first priority is that we're going to worship God and receive something from God tonight. And as God moves, we want to also share with others that are in their homes and different places that don't have the ability to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Let them know that there is a God that loves them. There is hope. There is love. There is peace and there's joy. Still working in the kingdom of God. We're just so blessed tonight to be a part of God's family. And as we start tonight, we want to take a few moments here and uh, take some prayer requests because there is Lots of people that need prayer tonight that are in our world for many, many different reasons. We have those tonight that are sick and uh, they need a healing touch in their bodies. We have those that have lost their jobs over the last few days and don't know how they're going to pay the bills next month, next week, how they're going to buy groceries tomorrow. Just a trying time in our world today. We want to pray for those, that God would reach down and give them strength and that God would make a way even though there seems to be no way. And our country is in crisis tonight with the coronavirus. We want to pray for our leaders tonight of our country, that they would be able to make good decisions based upon science rather than political correctness. We want to pray for all of our medical professionals tonight, that God would give them wisdom and that the godly people in the medical field would find answers to the problems that perplex our world tonight. And we know that God is the source of all knowledge and inspiration. And so tonight, those are some things that are on my heart I want to pray for. All of our churches across the United States tonight that are not able to have church, that God would keep the flock and encourage them and strengthen them tonight. And those that are having church, that God would put a hedge of protection around his people and keep us from all of the evil and all of the perversion that's in our world today. So what is on your hearts tonight? What are some other things tonight that we can pray for that you know that God wants to reach down and do a work in? Brother Rainey. Yeah, let's keep praying uh, for my dad and keep praying for Carl and his tobacco addiction he kicks it um and just keep me in prayer on the wisdom on the job and just god's wisdom in my life all right god can be with us on our job god can give us wisdom there uh, we want to see all of the lost sheep tonight that have wandered outside of the safety of god's heart find their way back to the foot of the cross there is a place a place of repentance a place where that they can come and and find uh, the way back that Jesus would be able to be the Lord and Savior of their life tonight. And that's what we want to pray, that God would allow the times that we live in to touch these people and bring them back to the cross. Anybody else tonight? Amen. Brother Jonathan. Continue to pray for revival and that God would reach to hearts and souls through this time. All right. But everybody to stand with us, dear God, we come to you in prayer tonight. All power in heaven and earth is in the name of Jesus. 
God, we call out to you right now, Lord, that you would begin to move with the power of the Holy Ghost. You would begin to flow, Lord, the needs that we see tonight, Lord. We know you are working on them before we ask, oh God. But God, we ask you to reach down and to touch your children and to work in their lives, oh God, so that the darkness around them can be penetrated with the light of the gospel. That our love and our compassion and our understanding and our hope and our help, God, would be able to splash out upon others, oh Lord. And God, that they would find their way to the foot of the cross and know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, that you are the Almighty God, and by your stripes you are healed. You are a God that healeth us. We believe in you and we trust in you tonight, oh God. We know that you're moving and you're going to touch lives and souls and individuals. We're going to have the testimony to go tell, oh Lord, and we're going to go tell it that others might know, hallelujah, that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm going to start out tonight and do some old school singing. You may have never heard an old preacher sing some of the old songs the old time way, but I grew up and heard some men of God and life moved on by and we found ourselves doing great and wonderful things in life. But uh, when we found that God had a, a call upon us to do a little bit of music, we got our old guitar back out and this is all I know how to do, folks, is what happened when I was a young man and a child to sing and worship God. And I know that so many others can connect with this tonight. This is not all we're going to have. There are going to be others that are going to come and they're going to sing some songs tonight. And We're thankful for all the talent and all the abilities in this church. And uh, But tonight, just worship with me. Ignore, amen, everything but the words and the touch of the Holy Ghost tonight because that... It's what we need to get us through the times when darkness is on every side. Page number 36, let me walk in the light. Every hour of the day, keep me dead.
And we praise him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the light that shineth in the darkness. The dark may comprehend it not. But we know tonight, oh God, that you are our light, oh God. There is no darkness that can resist the light. Hallelujah. There is power tonight in the name of Jesus. There is no weapon that is formed against us that is going to prosper. We've got the power of the name of Jesus tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the power of Jesus. Hallelujah. When the light comes into your life, there's things that begin to happen. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things pass away, and behold, all things become new. When the light comes in, the freedom comes with the light. The darkness is bondage. The darkness will hold us. The darkness will keep us bound up. But I want you to know when Jesus comes, he comes to set you free. In our songbook tonight, page number 172, he set me free. Once like a bird. so thankful tonight to be able to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. John 4 and 24 is an awesome scripture. If you don't have it memorized tonight, it would be good to add to your bucket list of scriptures to memorize. For God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When we know who Jesus is, then we begin to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords, the almighty God. Just continue with us tonight as we worship the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. Certainly good to be in the house of God today. That's right. Amen. Amen. Oh, the place I'd rather be. 
me. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to worship the Lord together. We've got the glory and the honor that is due his name. And, uh, I mean, one of the things that David did was that the Ark of the Covenant was the place where the Spirit of God resided. And then when the Ark of the Covenant was brought and came into Jerusalem, his, it was his home. It was the place where he lived. The Spirit of God was brought where he lived. The Bible said that he danced before the Lord. Right. Amen. The Bible says that as he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, that every seven paces he would stop. He would dance and worship before the Lord. As they brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Now, when he got to Jerusalem, he began to dance. The Bible says he took off his royal robes. And then he danced right next to his servants and praised God because he stripped himself of his royalty and said, Hey, I'm no better than you when we're before God. Amen. It doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, where you're at. That's when we come before God, we're just another servant of God. Amen. The Bible says that when he began to dance and worship and praise God, that he wasn't worried about what was going on around him. There was a lady sitting up on the, on the balcony up there that looked at her. It was his wife, Michael. And she was the wife of a, or rather the, daughter of another king when she saw him the bible says that she she despised him she said, i can't understand you went and stripped you all all of your royalty and stripped yourself of all of that and, and behaved like a fool in front of all these people and david said i will be more vile than thus in my own sight in other words he said i'll be more fanatical than this because i'm praising jesus yeah. amen we're going to be the people of god we're going to worship god tonight we're going to give god the glory and the honor we're going to put all of our heart our mind our soul and our strength into worshiping god Hallelujah. Let God move on us. Let God put inside of you a praise and respond to the Spirit of God tonight. Amen. And all those folks at home, let loose. You might be in front of your couch. You might be in your living room. You might be in your dining room. I don't know where you are, but lift your hands and worship God with us. Let the Spirit of God move where you are right now, for God wants to do a mighty work where you are right now. Amen. Let's worship to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 
We worship you, Papa. We worship you, Jesus. Amen. There's nothing more precious than the blood of Jesus. Cleanses us from sin. Amen. It is our power to be healed. Nothing like the blood of Jesus. says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one place, one accord, all with one mind. The Bible says there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all of the house where they were sitting. They appeared in the cloven tongues, individual tongues of fire, and it sat upon each of them and they all began to speak with other tongues, languages they hadn't learned before. And the tongues sat upon each of them and they began to speak with their tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. Others there thought they were drunk and said, these men are drunk. But Peter got up and said, These men are not drunk as ye suppose, seeing but it's the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Amen. And he got up and he began to preach and said, Hey, this is this is something that you need. Amen. And he gave the plan of salvation. Hallelujah. But we're going to sing to the Lord. And there's anything you need, I want you to know that Jesus is here for you. Amen. I, I don't know where you're at. 
those people that are watching online, I don't know where you're at right now, but I, I want you to understand that if you need something from God, the door is open. Hallelujah. All you have to do is say his name. And when you call upon the name of Jesus, he's going to hear you. Whatever your need might be, whatever that you need in your life, whether it be breakthrough, victory, whether you need to have a friend right now, whether you need somebody to talk to, whether you need to feel the presence of God right now, if you begin to call on the name of Jesus, if you begin to lift his name, that God will hear you, God will meet with you.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Woo! Amen, amen, amen. We're thankful for God's goodness. Can we just praise him? Hallelujah. Truly, oh God, you have been good to us. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy, oh God. Blessed be the name of the Lord today. Amen. We're going to give it to the Lord tonight. Thankful for all of God's goodness. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. It's been an awesome God. God that is faithful, a God that will take care of us, a God that is an on time God, is always there for his people. Dear God, we ask you to reach down right now to bless your people, oh God. Lord, that you would touch each and every one of your children, oh God. Lord, we know you have windows in heaven that you can open up, oh Lord, and bless your children, God, that they can continue to do your work. We rebuke any hindering cause that will come against the church. Anything that will try to stop the work of Calvary, we know that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We believe in it. Bless your children in Jesus. You that are online tonight, you can go to pts.church.com, p-t-s-c-h-u-r-c-h.com. Click on the donate button and bless our ministry. Bills are still here to be paid at the church. We want to thank you for all of you that are supporting us tonight. We're going to come, we're going to worship, and we're going to give. Lord bless you. You say thanks. Fireside chat. Oh, Lord. Just take a moment and address the issues of the moment and of the hour. I learned or memorized Psalms chapter 3 as a young boy in Sunday school, and it has served me well. And there's just so much in this verse that you can literally spend 10 weeks teaching it. I've done it in this chapter. But for just a moment, I want to talk about Psalms chapter 23. If you could turn in your Bibles and find that. Just a little fireside chat on a cold, dreary afternoon here in Seminole, Oklahoma. The Lord you know, the, there are two foundational facts in the universe. There is a God, and me and you are not Him. That's right. The Lord, when we find out who Jesus is, we will be like Thomas, my Lord and my God. The Lord is my shepherd. Here the psalmist David has taken ownership and saying that he is my shepherd. I am going to be one of his flock. I am going to be one that is willing to be tended to by the shepherd. He didn't say, I am a goat, and I am going to range in the mountains and kick over the buckets and kill the trees. He said, I. 
have a shepherd that is the Lord. I want you to know tonight when you're under the care of the shepherd Jesus Christ, and he's ordained and put the pastor in the church as the under shepherd, the one that is taking care of that part of the flock. Then you can realize that even though David made a bold statement, it can become a true statement in your life. He said, I shall not want. Now I realize there's people in our world today that want a lot of things. We have people that want a new car, they want a new house, they want a new job, they want a boat, they want to kill a 20 pound Whatever, catfish. <laughs> Woo! Kill a 12 point buck. They want a lot of different things. But when the Lord becomes your shepherd and you begin to be a sheep and you suddenly say, Lord, I want your desires to be my desires. We know that I want your will to be my will. Then suddenly we see our wants come into pass because we want what God wants. And you know, it's amazing because God always gets what he wants. Right. Mm -hmm. Verse number two, he said, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Green pastures. There's something about a sheep. They are wanting green pastures. They're wanting something that's alive. They're wanting something that's growing. They wanted something that has nutrition in it so that they can grow. Tonight you need to be in a church and in a place where there is life and growth and where there is spiritual nourishment that will give your soul something that will enhance it and grow it. And that the kingdom of God is active and alive. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. He leadeth me beside the still waters. There's something about it when you are wanting a peaceful setting. You're not looking for Niagara Falls, are you? Niagara Falls is the kind of water that brings excitement. You try to get in a barrel and go over it. But when you're looking for a peaceful setting, you're wanting still waters, the babbling brook, because it's in that peaceful still water that you find that good, clean water, the water that is a cleansing, and that water that will refresh and renew you. Each and every one of us during this time of turmoil, where there is the raging mighty Niagara falling around us, can find that brook where that we can be renewed in our Holy Ghost. Where that the Spirit of God can speak peace into your universe. And just like Peter was sinking as he began to walk out to Jesus, you may feel like that you're a sinking in the raging waters around you. But if you'll just reach out to Jesus tonight, no matter where you are, and say, my Lord and my God, I give my life to you. He restoreth my soul. Restoration is a beautiful thing. We've had a lot of things in life that we've tried and it didn't work. We've had a lot of great and wonderful things that we brought into our life that didn't last. But when we find those things that have served us well and time and life has made them fall apart and deteriorate and they've broken down, Many of those have been discarded and thrown away. Kind of reminds you of the dreams of a youth. When we bring them to Jesus, he begins the restoration process. A process that makes it better than new. I would just imagine there's a 57 Chevy out there somewhere today that somebody has restored and they've snuck them a CD player into it. <laughs> that wasn't original equipment. No, sir. 
But you see, they were restoring it. They, they were making it better than new. I'll never forget, my cousin David came down from Dallas and he had his 57 Chevy. And he'd put him an aftermarket enhancement on it. It was an eight-track player. One day, my brothers and my older cousin was out gallivanting around the, the country. Me and my young cousin went out to that 57 Chevy and we began to play that eight-track tape player. That was some really high-tech equipment 50 years ago. And the songs begin to sing and, you know, we can think about how God can restore things, the broken memories, the broken dreams. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What's wrong with living right? That's right. What harm can come with being a righteous man? Because the steps of a righteous man are guided by the Lord. That's right. Mm -hmm. Verse number four speaks to many hearts and individuals in our world at this very moment. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Doesn't matter where you're at tonight. If you've got the Holy Ghost, Jesus is with you. That's right. He is there to lead and guide you. He knows what tomorrow holds. He's got tomorrow in his hand. Can you just allow him to be your guide? Can you just allow him to bring some peace into your world at this moment? Knowing that he is going to take you through this? Did he forsake the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace? Did he forsake Daniel in the lion's den? Did he forsake Jonah in the belly of the well? I want to tell you, I have a God that has an exit strategy that is already planned. Amen. He says, Thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Mm -hmm. Now that old shepherd crook is used a lot of times as an instrument of correction. That's right. But it is a comfort to know that if something is not right, Jesus is going to make it right. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than being in a situation where things are messed up and there's nobody going to correct the problem. Mm -hmm. And you know that the problem is just going to continually be multiplied and it's going to go greater and greater. We serve a God tonight that has the best reset button in the world. I think he's pressed it. Well, He said, I'm going to set things back right again. He says in verse number five, Thou preparest the table, talking about our good shepherd, before me in the presence of my enemy. There's a lot of people that didn't have a need for the church and they didn't have a need for God because their gods had served them well. Mm. I want you to know the gods of this world has failed them tonight, but my God has not failed me. That's right. Yeah. My God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has promised that He is perfecting a church and getting it ready so that when the trumpet sounds, we're going to say a hallow over here and a hallelujah over there. Come on. Amen. Meanwhile, we reach out to a world and say, there is hope in Jesus. There right. is confidence in Jesus. Right. There is peace in Jesus. Right. When the Lord called us to Seminole 13 years ago, He told us, name it Peace Tabernacle because your church is going to be a place of peace right. for a troubled world. Yeah. I feel peace in the house tonight. Amen. Amen. Thou knowest my head with oil. The anointing. It's part of the process. They would take that sheep and they'd rub that olive oil in their skin and suddenly all of the pests would leave them alone. 
I want you to know God will come in. He will begin to allow his anointing to flow over us. And he'll begin to work in our life. And we see the miracles that come as a result of it. In verse number five, he concludes, My cup runneth over. So what does that mean? That he has a shaky hand and he spills the coffee when he pours it? <laughs> no, I don't think that's what he means. Even though I've drunk a few cups of coffee that were so good that I was willing to drink the runoff that came out of the saucer. But what he's trying to illustrate is is that God's blessings are so abundant and right. so great, just right. like his mercy, yes, sir. that he doesn't have to worry about wasting them. Come on. Mm -hmm. He just fills that cup up and he wants to make sure our cup is full. Right. He wants to make sure we have all that we need to be an overcomer. Right. Come on. So he fills it up and allows it to run over the side. Yes, sir. And he may be thinking about those that are around us that's never had their cup filled up before. Well. And maybe a little bit of splash over into their world. Well, come, come on. on. And they will be blessed yes, as a result of the blessings that have flowed into our life. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. He concludes in verse number six. Surely goodness. And mercy. In our modern world, the word good don't mean nothing. <laughs> It's unfortunate that our language has destroyed the meaning of the word good. Almost, when somebody says something is good, it's a plot way of them saying it's sorry. But that's not what God means when he says it's good. Think about this. God had created the earth, and he had formed all the oceans, and he had placed all the animals on it. That kind of boggles the mind, somebody being able to do all of that in six days. And when he gets done, what does he call it? He said, it's good. It's good. Your awesome is pale to God's good. Well, That's right. You need Come to get on. rid of your awesome and start God's good working in your life. Yes. Come on. <laughs> when God brings the good in, there's nothing left to describe it. And God's mercy. You know what? You may have made mistakes. You may have taken the wrong road. You may be confused tonight. But God has mercies. Every day His mercies are abundant. He'll allow you to make it to a place where that you can begin to do it right. Amen. He's calling those that are outside the ark of safety back into the place of safety at the foot of the cross where that the blood will cover you right. and that you will be ready to receive God's blessings. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, amen. And he concludes with, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. forever. Yes, sir. I want you to know there's no better place. There's no better place in the world than the house of God. Right. Amen. Over the last three years, I have traveled around the United States of America and attended many conferences and meetings. And I have told many of them what I'm going to tell you tonight. <clears throat> the altar in the house of God is a place like no other. Tonight you may not be in God's house and you may have to build your own altar. But you see, an altar is a place that's dedicated to meeting God. And I know something tonight. When you come to Peace Tabernacle, God will meet you at these altars because God has met everyone that I have seen come to these altars. He has met with them. He has reached out to them and they have felt His presence. And lives have been changed. The Holy Ghost has been poured out in believers at these altars. Revelations have come at these altars. Blessings have come at these altars. Promises and commitments and covenants have been made at these altars. A place where you say, God, I will meet you. I am thankful tonight 
for the house of God. And you may not be in the house of God physically in your body. And I'm glad for all of you that are here tonight. But no matter where you find yourself at, when you're in the house of God or you're worshiping God, God is drawing you to meet with Him. Because He has a work that He wants to do in our life. Truly, God is the only one that can transform man. He's the only one that can change us into a vessel of honor and glory. Mm-hmm. And when you get the Holy Ghost the Bible way, just like they did in Acts chapter 2, you'll love the house of God. Amen. Church, can you join me as we pray for those tonight that needs the mercy and the blessing and the peace that only God can give? Dear Jesus, you see all of those tonight, oh God, that are in turmoil. Their life is turned upside down, Lord. They don't know which way they're going to turn. They don't know how that they will face tomorrow. God, let them find the true shepherd of their soul. Allow them tonight to take Psalms 23 and to read that until they can move, be moved by the peace of the Holy Ghost. They can know that you will change them and you will make a way. That you will never leave them. You'll never forsake them. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. So tonight we are going to bring you a man of God, one of our local evangelists here, to bring you a word from God tonight. We appreciate Brother Rainey, his ministry, what God has done in his life. Brother Rainey is coming tonight with a message from God. What do we want him to do? Preach the Preach word. Preach the word. Come, Brother Rainey. Amen. Bring unto us the word of the Lord tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight, you can definitely tell that Pastor wasn't anointed in anything that he said because he didn't talk about food. <laughs> <laughs> For those of y'all that don't know, it's just kind of a joke around here. If you ever hear this man really get with it and really preach, you're going to hear the taters, you're going to hear the gravy, you're going to have a little salt and pepper on the side of it, maybe a bit of Mexican if he really gets anointed, and that's just how it is. <laughs> but you know, I don't know how long I'm going to be here tonight, but I do have a word from the Lord I've been praying on and thinking on and such, and... If you would, just go ahead and stand. We'll just pray that God preach his message. He's the preacher tonight, not me. So let's just go ahead and say a word of prayer and get into this thing. Lord Jesus, this is your message tonight. This is your people. This is your church. Pray, Lord God, that you speak through me. Don't let me interrupt you. I pray, Lord God, that you work with your own word. You do what you're going to do here tonight. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you just keep me out of the way. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy and your goodness. And if you'll remain standing for just a moment, we're going to go to the book of Judges, the 16th chapter, starting at the fourth verse. Starting at the fourth verse. And it says, And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. And verse 6 says, And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. I would like to preach on a subject entitled, Discerning Delilah. You may be seated. Now the situation here, for those of y'all that ain't too familiar, is you have a man named Samson in the 13th chapter of Judges. His mama was told that he was going to be a Nazarite from his birth, that he would begin to deliver Israel out of the clutches of the Philistines. 
And as Samson was born and as he grew, his hair would begin to grow. And there would be times the Spirit of God would move on him and he would accomplish great feats of strength. He wants, of course, we all know the stories about the jawbone of the donkey. We all know the stories of how Samson ripped apart the lion. But here tonight, Samson was going to be taken advantage of. Right. You see, Samson had a problem in his life. He had the problem that he was listening to some seducing spirits well. that began to talk with him and began to tempt him out of the way that he should go. Right. You see, the word seducing, now, this is where it gets into the theme of the message here. The word seducing is actually a Greek word. It is not an English word. When you break it down, it basically translates to the art of leading astray. Now, there's many ways that we can be led astray. Come on. When we think of seducing, we just think of the physical aspect, which was obviously on display here. But whenever the devil comes by and tries to lead us astray, there's many things that he puts in our lives and puts right. in our paths. Then the entire goal of it is not necessarily to destroy us, not necessarily to immediately bring our downfall. Come on. But a lot of times he's just wanting us to turn from following the path of righteousness and just take a little bit off well. and start walking another way. Come on. He's here tonight to try to lead us astray. Right. Preach to us. Now the Bible says, and another aspect of this is, the joy of the Lord is our strength. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Right. So, you know, how this relates to Samson, it's a perfect type and a shadow of what the devil tries to do to the saints in the church. Come on. A lot of times he begins to lay things in our lives to draw us away so that our joy will not be full. Come on. In Nehemiah 8 and uh, 10, it said that, uh, you know, not to be sorrowful. It said that you needed to, you know, you need to eat and you need to give to others so that they may eat. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yes. You see, the way that things work around here, the church runs on faith. Come on. Right. And faith and joy are interconnected. You know, if you don't know what joy is, basically Webster's Dictionary defines it as a great happy feeling or the expression of such a feeling Come on. or things that cause those kinds of feelings. You know, and that's uh, basically what it comes down to. It comes down to cheerfulness. It comes down to excitement. You know, whenever we're having faith, for example, when we're reaching out to people in faith, believing that God's going to, Get a hold of their heart. Come on. You know, our faith goes forward and begins to do the work, but it's not our faith that brings strength to the work. Well, what brings strength to the work is our cheerfulness, it's our joy. Come on. You know, a lot of times I just feel that we go through our daily routine, we start praying, we start reading our Bible, we start witnessing to folks on the job, we start witnessing to folks on the street, and sometimes. We're not, you know, to the place of dread. Come on. We're not to the place where we just dread praying, you know, where we have lost all of our joy. But I feel as though tonight that the devil is trying to put a stumbling block in front of the church and begin to get our focus off of God and off of his work and begin to focus on other things. Well, all right. I'm here tonight that not only could your joy be present, but that your joy will be full. That Come you on. can go forward today and you can witness to people with strength. Come on. There's something about it. Whenever there's something about it, whenever Samson began to try to operate without his joy, without the strength, when he was bound up by the Philistines and he thought to himself, Well, I've been led astray by Delilah, but it ain't no big deal. It ain't nothing. I'll just get back up at, as I always have at other times. All he right. thought that he would be able to get a hold of the joy, but he was already led astray. Come on. Be it by sin or be it by attitude, be it by distractions in the physical, he was led astray and lost his strength. Come on. And whenever he lost his strength, that's when the devil could come in. You see, that's the reason why the Philistines sent Delilah. The Philistines are a type and a shadow of the devil who's being crafty, who's being cunning, 
The Philistines knew full and well that there is absolutely no way they were going to beat Samson by themselves. Well, I'm just saying, if that big, if that boy grabs a jawbone of a donkey and kills three thousand people, you ain't got no chance. Well, yeah. Particularly if he actually gets serious and gets himself some real armor and a real weapon. All right. And the devil tonight, he's viewing the church and he's seeing that there is no way he can prevail. The Bible itself even says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Well, says, so the on. devil has to be cunning and crafty. Right. He has to begin to plant distractions in our lives. He has to begin planting things in our minds, Come on. thoughts, attitudes that begin leading towards his distractions. Come on. You know, there's something about it in the order of the scriptures I just read. In verse 4, it basically is summarized as Samson began to lust. Now, lust, again, is one of those words that is misunderstood. Lust is not just the physical aspect of it, the things we think about. You know, if I look over and I see a candy bar and I really want that candy bar, I'm lusting after that candy bar. You know, if I'm really wanting money, I'm lusting after it. It just basically comes down to a strong desire for something. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this is important is the Bible itself says that every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. Whenever lust uh, conceives, it brings forth sin. When sin conceives, it brings forth death. Right, right amen. Delilah couldn't have seduced Samson if Samson wasn't lusting after her in the first place. Well... All right. Come on. And a lot of times, the reason why we allow things to distract us is because we begin to lust after things. Well, come on. You know, well, I just kind of, I've had a hard day at work. I just kind of want to come home and relax a bit. Yeah, I know I need to pray. Yeah, I know. And I'm, I got to do this. I got to do that and all that. But you know what? I just kind of want to sit down for a minute and I just want to veg out and I just want to forget about everything. And then next thing you know, you're watching YouTube or something, or you're playing on your phone or something like that. You're just sitting down enjoying Delilah. Well. And many times you'll be there for several hours, and it'll be almost time to go to bed. And you're just like, well, Lord, I guess I didn't pray like I should have today. Well. But oh, well, there's always tomorrow. Well, come on. I'm here to tell you today, there's some Delilahs the devil's trying to put in our lives. Come on. And not every Delilah is sin. That's right. All right. Oh, yeah, we all know sin separates from God. Right. We all know that sin will destroy us. Right. But there's some things that aren't necessarily sin. Come on. But if it's bringing attention away from God, come on. if it's taken away from your spirituality, then eventually it's going to be getting taken away from your joy. Right. And you're going to start trying to pray one day, and it's going to be a drudgery. You're going to begin to say, oh, why do I have to pray? Well, oh, why do I have to read my Bible? I just don't want to do it no more. Come on, you're preaching. We all go through some of those times. I've been there. I've done that. Amen. You know, but we got to rise up out of that because there's something about it. Whenever we begin to be excited Come on. about prayer, then it's no longer a burden. Come on. Yeah. When we begin to pray and seek God and say, God, Fill my life with your joy and take away all the Delilahs that are going to try to take it from me. Then we begin to have an easier time living for God. Come on. You know, in uh, Psalms 28, starting at verse 7 in the Bible, it says, That hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me, and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek my, ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Come on. You see, David was praying in chapter 27, verse number 7. <laughs> and that led in to chapter 28, verse number 7. Where it says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. Right. My heart trusted in Him. And I am helped, therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth. Come on. And with my song I will praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Right. You see, David was praying in chapter 27. That prayer led to his relationship with God being strengthened, which led to God himself being his strength. Come on. How that applies in our life. 
The reason why the devil wants to send his Delilah is because he wants us to separate ourselves from God. Come on. You see, a lot of folks, they don't like churches preaching on separation, but I'm telling you right now, either the church is going to preach on separation or the world's going to tell you to be separate. That's true. You know, <laughs> hey, folks are just like, oh, no, the world's just all about doing whatever you want. No, it's not. That's Come true. on. The world's all about being brainwashed by the devil and going into sin, becoming bound by addictions. Right. That's what the world's all about. That's the world's separation. God's separation is turn away from the Delilah that is deceiving you. Right. Turn away from your alcohol, from your cigarettes, from your cussing, from everything in your life that is deceiving you and taking away your joy, trying to destroy you. Right. It was Delilah that began to deceive Samson. And whenever Samson believed her and began to share with her the secrets of his heart, the secret of his great strength, verse 6, whenever Delilah began doing that, is whenever that capturing of Samson was able to take place. Come on. And you know, that's that separation I was talking about. I feel like I'm all over the place, but I'm just trying to follow God here. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> but that was the separation I'm talking about. Samson was separated from the people of God. He was separated from his strength. In Judges 16 and 21, it talks about how Samson, the great and mighty warrior, more than a conqueror, was brought down to be a slave to the Philistines. Right. All right. That's right. And you know what? Where was Delilah when Samson had his eyes plucked out? Oh God. Where was Delilah when Samson was grinding at the mill? Where was Delilah whenever they chained him up to the pillars and they began to mock him well, and they began to spit at him and they began to beat him and they began to forsake his basic needs as a human being? Well, Where was Delilah? Well, come on. Whereas before she was sitting down with Samson's head in her lap just saying, oh, don't you worry about those Philistines, Come Samson. Come on. Don't you worry about your mission of God. Don't you worry about living holy. Don't you worry about living righteously. You just sit right here and let Delilah take good care of you. Well, all right. You just sit right here and you get comfortable. Everything else just don't matter. Come on. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of uh, what... Probably what conversations would have happened between these two that wasn't recorded. I wonder if there was a time when Samson was walking down the street, maybe had Delilah on his arm, and he was looking over and saw a Philistine smacking an Israelite upside the face. And I believe that Samson was a fighter. I believe that Samson had something deep within himself as a man, that he's going to try to protect those he cares about. Right. right. So maybe he's walking down the street one day and he sees this happen and something rises up in him and he says, oh, I can't stand for none of this. That's my brother that he's beating on. Well, That's my sister that dirty Philistine is touching. And then Delilah just says, oh, Samson, don't worry about any of that. They'll be fine. You just need to spend some more time with me. Well, you don't need to worry about any of them. Come on. All right. But it's my brother. That's, that's, that's someone that I care about, someone I love, that the devil is just stomping on him. i got to do something, Delilah. No, no. You just calm down, Samson. Just calm down. Everything will be just fine. Look, you know, the Philistines already done beating them anyway. They're walking away. Why, why go over there and do that? Mm. All right. Come on. Mm-mm-mm. But you know, as that relates to the church, there's another point I kind of want to bring across here. As it relates to the church also, you see, Delilah, whenever she sold out Samson for the money, she got what she wanted, and she really didn't care what happened to Samson. You know, she really and truly did not need all of Samson's strength to leave him. Let me explain what I mean. The Bible says, Samson, tell me the source of thy great strength. Right. There's a difference between the great strength and the regular strength. You know, Samson still had his regular human strength. Right. right. He was still able to walk. He was still able to do some things. 
You know, we don't know how strong he was in himself. We don't know. Right. Maybe he was a bodybuilder. Maybe he was an average person. You know, but there were some things he could do. But he couldn't do the things he used to. Right. He couldn't fight off those Philistines. Right. right. And so as it relates to the church, you know, and our joy being our strength, you know, the devil doesn't need all of our strength to be gone Come on. to destroy us as believers or as Christians. Come on. Hey, truthfully, we all know that the devil wants everyone in the church to die lost. We know the devil wants to destroy all of the church, but you know what? The devil is a finite being. He only has so many resources at his disposal. That's true. So he's fine if some people, you know, they make it to heaven. You know, it was something I was praying about and I was thinking about as uh, I was praying about this message. A situation like this. Say someone dies and they're in the Lord and they're on their way up to glory and they just said, huh, take that Satan, you didn't get me. And Satan's just like, nah, fair enough. Fair enough. You can't get everybody. I know that. I'm the devil. But you know what? There's no one to take your place. Well, come on. That's still one less saint that I have to deal with. Come on. I may not have destroyed you. I may not have caused you to die lost. But I took away enough of your joy so you couldn't be effective. Come on. Like you should have been uh, effective on. on this Preach. world. And now the church has suffered a loss come on. as Preach. a result of it. So who's really winning, boy? Come on. Oh, I tell you what. I don't want the devil to be able to talk that kind of trash whenever I'm going up into well, glory. Come on. I want to be able to look the devil in the face and say, take that devil. I was not ever able to lose my joy. I was not ever able to lose my effectiveness. Come on. people I'm leaving behind come that's on. able to take my place in the world. Right. Hallelujah. And so, you know, we understand the devil doesn't have a problem with that kind of a compromise. And also, and I feel myself beginning to come to a close. You know, I went to uh, SORP training there Friday, and it kind of plays into all this since we're talking about the joy of the Lord being our strength. You know, faith, I used to think of faith as just an abstract thing, as just kind of something that you have and you just kind of keep to yourself. I never thought of faith before coming to church uh, as something that you put in action. If I can uh, have Jonathan come up for a minute, and I'll give a demonstration. You know, faith and joy have to mesh together in order for your action to have strength. Face me. Now, let's say we have Jonathan here, and he's got a lot of dread in his life about living for God. Don't move your feet. He has a lot of dread in his life about living for God. He's off posture. You know, he doesn't have any strength. He may have an action. He may have some faith and try to push against me. But in this kind of a position, whenever he's off balance, whenever he doesn't have any strength, it doesn't take much to knock him over. But whenever Jonathan gets some joy in his life, he's excited about praying. He leans forward. He begins to push. He's got a solid stance. I can't knock him over near as easily. I can't just push him over a whole lot. And he begins to have some people get behind him. And they push harder and harder. And then all of a sudden, we're pressing the devil back. Well, you see, on. that's how it works. The relationship between faith and joy. If you don't got joy, then you can't fight back. Come on. But if you've got joy, then your action has something behind it. Come on. And when you begin to pray and you begin to rebuke the devil, then all of a sudden he begins to back up. And as your church gets behind you, it's just like the sort team going in with the shield. You get six people lined up behind the shield man, and I don't care how big that inmate is. I don't care how fast he comes at you. I don't care how hard right. he pushes. He is not going to overcome the sort team. And well, in the same way, the devil will not overcome the church. Come on. But it's important for us today, you know, to see those distractions for what they are. You know, we justify it a lot of times. I've been there. I've done that. I've had to repent of it. Yes, sir. You know, well, it's just a little thing. You know, I, uh, I can do this for just a little while. 
You know, I can, uh, it's not really all that big of a deal, but it's taking away some of your joy. Come on. Right. It's taking away your time with God. Come on. You know, whereas used to, you could pray for two or three hours and it not, you know, and it'd be a wonderful thing. It'd be a wonderful experience. Now, all of a sudden, you have a hard time praying for 30 minutes. Come on. I've been there. I've done that, too. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not trying to put a number on things, you understand. I'm not trying to be legalistic. But what I'm saying is when something begins to take away your spirituality, Come on. you need to be concerned. Right. right. It's an interesting entry here in the book of Hebrews. You know, uh, and this will be my last scripture I read. Now, a lot of folks, they talk about Samson as the greatest story of wasted potential in the Bible. I would say that's probably true with maybe the exception of Saul. But what it says here in Hebrews 11, verse 32, and I'm going to jump around a bit, says, And what more shall... What sh ah. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Now here's Samson right here. This part here is Samson. Out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Right. You know, instead of being one of the greatest heroes in Bible history, because Samson allowed himself to be distracted by Delilah, he was just mentioned as an afterthought All in right. the Hall of Fame. Right. Wow. You know, Hebrews 11 is many times called by many people as the Hall of Faith, or the Hall of Fame, Samson was just an afterthought, mm -hmm. specifically because he allowed his distractions to destroy him. Right. And uh, actually, I think I'm going to close tonight on 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10 through 11, where it says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, godly sorrow is something that's going to save you. What does that mean? Matthew 1 and 21 says, And ye shall have a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Right. You see, salvation in the Bible is not just making it to heaven. Salvation in the Bible is talking about being free from your sins, right. being free from things that destroy you. Godly sorrow is where it begins, where you begin to be sorry, not that you got caught, but sorry that you did it. Never be ashamed of that fact that you are sorry. Right. That's why the Bible says it's not to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world worketh death. Verse 11. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. You see, after godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, Come on. then the joy comes right on back. Right. Whenever Samson was standing there and his hands were upon the pillars and his hair began to grow back again, Come on. that's a type and a shadow of repentance. Right. If you've allowed distraction or you've allowed sin to creep in your life and it's taken away your strength, it's taken away your joy, then you begin to put your hands on those pillars Come on. and you begin to repent before Woo! God. Let your godly yeah. sorrow be turned from sorrow to joy and allow the strength of God to enter back into your life again. Praise the Lord. And so, with all that said, let us go forward this week and let us be cheerful in our evangelism. You know, if you've been dreading talking to folks about Jesus, begin to pray and ask God to not only to forgive, 
you know, uh, to forgive that, but also to help you right. to become joyful, cheerful, excited. When I talk to folks about Jesus, I don't want to just be someone that comes by and says, well, this Jesus is a good thing. This Jesus, it's oh so wonderful. I want to be like the old time Quakers. You know how they got that name? Because when they talked about what they believed, oh, they were quaking. They were so excited. Boy, you wonder why I believe those folks had the Holy Ghost. They began to quake, boy. <laughs> this is what I believe. This is Jesus we're talking about. Oh, you're sick? Jesus can heal you. Right. Oh, you got the coronavirus? Jesus can heal you. That's right. I've seen it happen before, and I will see it happen again. Yes. Oh. You got something in your life that you need to get out? I know a Jesus that can help you. Right. Praise the Lord. All right. Go forward with this in your heart. And uh, I'm done, so someone wants to come, we'll do the altar call. For anyone that wants to get some joy in their heart, your joy can begin at this altar. So... These altars are open. You just go ahead and pray if you want to. There you go. Thank you, Brother Rainey. Can we just gather around the front this afternoon and just reach out to the Lord here? Dear God, Lord, you see all of the obstacles that we face, oh God, each and every one of us. There is a robber God that has come by, the enemy of our soul, that Brother Rainey has told us about that is wanting to steal from us. That enemy is wanting to kill and destroy and to steal our peace and our joy. God, we ask you to not help us, Lord, as we connect out to you, O oh God. Sweep over me, O oh God. Wash over me, O oh God. Oh, my God. Yes, Lord. I need you to I am on food. Jesus, I need you to touch you can reach out to him. He's not a God that is far out. He's a God that is in hell. I am reaching to you. Here I am, Lord. Would you touch him? Here I am, Lord. Would you speak to him? Would you be alone? Would you have to him? Would you have to love him? Let the answers for me, O God. I come to you, O Lord, with a whole heart. Cast me all of my care. Yes, God, that your spirit fills this place right now. God, testify in the spirits uh, and in the hearts. Uh, and God, testify in the souls right now, my God. Uh, I pray that right now in the name of Jesus, uh, that you would begin to move in the touch. Uh, but in God, that the love of God would begin to flow and touch deeply uh, into the spirits, uh, into the hearts of people. Uh,